Please be seated. Take your Bible again and turn this time to Ephesians chapter 3. It's on page uh, 977 in the Pew Bible. We'll be looking at verses 14 through 19. You've already heard the reading in the Old Testament, which talked about the temple and the dedicationary prayer of the temple. One thing I do want to point out to that is Solomon's acknowledgement that nothing on earth can hold the presence of God, let alone this, this house I built, he said. And yet, the presence of God is here. And as we read in our text, the presence of God is in you. Think about that. You have uh, found the place. I'm going to look at one of these white sheets here. Ah. Climbing the ladder of prayer, Ephesians 3, 14 to 19. Pray for the things God wants. Pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. Pray for Christ to dwell in the heart. Pray to be filled with God's fullness. Let's hear God's word again, Ephesians 3, uh, 14 through 19. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant to you to be strengthened with a power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This is the word of God for us. Let's pray. Well, Lord, we thank you that you hear our prayers. Indeed, you are more ready to hear than we are often to pray. We ask that you would open our hearts to the treasure and power of prayer. Through Christ, we pray. He who prays for us. Amen. Prayer is offering up our desires to God. I remember when I was working with little children. What's prayer? Talking to God. Offer up that which is in your heart. Now, our catechism says we are to pray for things agreeable to God's will. That means we're to pray for good things. Well, yeah, we should be praying for good things. We don't ask God to help us with something that we know is really wrong. In fact, if you've got something in your mind that you're thinking about and Pray it to God. It's like, oh, I can't pray that to God. That's terrible. Well, maybe you shouldn't have it in your mind. That plotting thing of revenge. Whatever that is, right? Think about that. And when we pray, we're not really wanting God to do everything we want because that's not what prayer is. I don't even want what I want if it's not what God wants. This is what Jesus said when he prayed not my will, but yours be done. Now, of course, he was praying all that was on his heart. You don't think, well, I don't know what God's will is, so maybe I shouldn't pray this. No, you pray it. You tell God exactly what you want. You tell God how you feel. You tell God. This is what Jesus did in the garden. I mean, he was saying he came specifically to die on the cross and to bear the sin of the world. And there he was looking at it and knowing all that is and saying, is there some other way? Right? But in the end, it was not make this stop. It was not my will, but yours be done. We want to do and to pray even for the things that God wants us to pray for. Now, how do you know what God wants you to pray for? What are things that you should be praying for? Well, one thing is you could always look in the Bible and see what it says. And see what it says about prayer. Our passage is a prayer. It's a great prayer to be praying for one another. 
we should be doing this. This is the prayer that he prayed for the Ephesians. And I, this is like a ladder. I'll talk about this more again, but it just kind of moves further up from the, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Spirit, the presence of Christ, all the way up to the glory of God. I mean, what's our chief end? To glorify God, okay, and to enjoy him forever. Why did God create everything? For his own glory. It goes all the way to the top. This is what God has for us. This is what we pray for, the glory of heaven. Prayer could be difficult. It can be. It's hard. Uh, you pray for something. You, you pray wanting something to be happening. And the more you look at what God says about prayer, the more I realize any way that prayer is not me trying to change God's mind as much as God changing my heart changing who I am. The more you pray, the more in tune your heart gets with the Lord. Uh, Paul prays for the uh, Ephesians earlier. You might remember this down around uh, chapter 1, verse 15. For this reason I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love towards uh, all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in all of my prayers. That God, the Lord of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and of knowledge in him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you might know what is the hope to which he's called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance of the saints? What is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him in right hand in the heavenly place as far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but in the age to come. Like our passage, he prays for the Ephesians here. He's praying for them. And he's not praying out of obligation or duty. He's praying because he loves them. He wants the best for them. Isn't that how and why we pray for our loved ones? We want the best for them. He's compelled to pray because of his love. It's not a sense of obligation. And there is, as in our passage, a model of the sorts of things we pray for. I mean, what do you pray for someone if you don't know what their specific needs are? Well, bless them, Lord. Can you pray that? Yes, you can. Because what are you doing? You're taking their name, laying them before the Lord Jesus Christ with all that you have. But well, I tell you, you can, everything that was listed in that, uh, that's something you need. That's something I need. If you don't know how to pray for someone, you could just pray them that. Put their name in there. It's the same with our passage as well. We should be praying for and with each other. And when we pray specifically and we get the answers, we should share those. How often we'll have a prayer request for a long time. And then we get an answer. It could be a wonderful answer. Oh, there's the answer. Moving on. Should we not remember and rejoice in the answers that God gives? Isn't that even what Scripture does? We pray. So what do we pray? Well, I'll tell you that we might grow in the understanding of God. Certainly, this is what we want. Let's look again at our text, verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Okay, now, what reason? When you see something like that, you've got to look back before. Uh, he's talking about him being in prison. He says, don't lose heart. This is what he's saying in the verses before that. They're part of this fellowship of the, of the mystery, of the gospel. I think that as he prays this, because of all they've been through, because of their concern, he wants to know that the Lord is taking care of him. He wants them to know that, and he wants to know that the Lord is taking care of them. And so this is why he prays. God is doing these things at work in them. And God's the one who does it all. You know, there are false gods. They're not really gods. And I love the way the Old Testament 
Isaiah, particularly the prophet, says this. They make these, these gods. They, they get a piece of wood that they hope won't rot, and they, they carve out part of it, and they make that their idol. And then the shavings they throw into the fire to build their fire. And it's almost as if, well, what if you, what if you burned the god part, right? It makes no sense. And, and while they have eyes because you've made eyes, and they have ears because you've made ears, they don't hear and they don't see. They're not real gods. Well, we pray that we would know the real God. We would know and we would live in him. Verse 15. Um, that, that he kneels before the Father, and then, verse 15, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named. Now, there's a play on words here in the original. The Father, the, the potter, uh, he is uh, the one in whom the whole family, the whole patria is named. Uh, from the top down, we get understanding what fatherhood is. If those of you who are fathers, uh, remember that. We get our example from God the Father. We can and we should play, pray for unbelievers to get the blessing of God. In fact, we did that earlier, didn't we? We have loved ones that don't know Jesus. We pray that they would. They pray that their hearts would be changed. But we can always be praying for this for Christians as well. You know that God designed Christians to grow. You progress in your understanding. You grow in your love. You grow in these things. And that's what this prayer is about. Also, I think because this is so good for people in general, that we can use this to pray for other people. You know, we pray for missionaries, and I understand some of the things they go through, but you know that this is something they always need. You pray for your own day and for others in the day they're facing. You don't know what they're going to go through, but you know this is what they need. This is good to be praying. Again, I've called it a ladder of prayer. There's an old camp song we used to sing, We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder. Anybody know this one? We are climbing. Well, okay, some heads are nodding. The others, I won't sing it. But the ladder that it's talking about is the ladder that Jacob saw where there were this. The ladder went up into heaven, and the angels went up and down on it. That ladder represents Jesus. Heaven came down. Glory fills my soul, right? As that, that song goes. But we have this ladder which takes us back up. This is what's being described here. You have, by all rights, forgiveness of sin. By all rights, you are a member of God's family. By all rights, you are, you are made into a new creature. But it's not just by rights or technically or officially or juridically. It's in reality as well. You have new life. You have connection with Christ. And you're growing in your understanding of that. That's what this prayer is about. See, both of these are important. You need to know what the gospel says and hang on to it. And some churches are really big about knowing. Maybe that's us. Maybe that's me. We like to focus on the knowing, and it's important. But it's not just knowing. It's understanding and experiencing as well. You know, there's some churches that are focused very much on the experiencing, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it needs to be tied to the knowing. The knowing needs to tie, be tied to the experiencing. It's not just head knowledge. It's a knowledge that's real. Trouble can come when you emphasize the head knowledge and ignore the heart. Trouble can come when you emphasize the heart and ignore the head. Why? Well, it's from the scriptures that we understand. Faith comes by hearing. 
It's from the scriptures that we have this new life as we know Jesus. So this is a good prayer to pray. Pray it for yourself. Pray it for one another. Look at verse 16. According to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with his power through his spirit in your inner being. We need strength. We need strength as we're faced with temptation for sin. We need strength when we feel very weak, when we're suffering. Do you know how strong you are? I think I know how strong I am, but I really don't until I've been tested. If a fellow who did a lot of lifting at the gym would say, do you know how much you can lift? I would have two answers. Number one, uh, I don't know. And two, I, I bet a lot less than you. I'm not used to that. I don't understand that. I'm not tested. How do you know how much you can take? Now, the strength here it's talking about is not physical strength, but it's strengthened with the power of his spirit in your inner being. Now, how do you know the strength of the Holy Spirit is getting stronger in you? You know that because you see the Lord getting you through these things. And by the way, it's not just that somehow you've gotten strong. It's because the Lord is strong in you. It's nothing to be proud about, nor is it something to be overconfident in your own self. Because every Christian reaches the point where they don't have that strength in them, and they rely on the Lord to carry them. It's true. Strength is there to handle trials and temptations when you feel that, that difficulty physically. Go to the presence of the Holy Spirit. When you feel it emotionally, uh, go to the presence of the Holy Spirit. You need that strength. Uh, without that, you succumb, succumb to a temptation. Without that, you succumb to all sorts of things. The strength of the Holy Spirit, we move to the next, which is the Christ in your heart. I love this. Well, if you don't, if you don't understand, I, I really love this whole passage. But Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The force of this is that Christ takes residence in your heart. It's not just that he's there. When Abraham was through Canaan, he was, a, he was a, a sojourner. He didn't own anything except the place where he, he buried uh, his wife. There he was a stranger. But this is talking about Christ dwelling in your heart. This is where he lives. Now, okay, you have a guest come to your house. The guest is there. And you treat the guest a little more carefully, generally. You have certain closets you're going to keep shut. You have certain things, you know, there. And, and you're always kind of make sure everything okay with the guest. When someone lives there, they live there. They know where their room is. They know where the food, they know where the fridge is. They know what needs done. They do the things there. If uh, a guest is at your house and the toilet backs up, you don't say, hey, um, now, if you, if you dwell with a plumber, I suppose you would. But this is the kind of thing that we do when we need help. We call out for help for the people who live there because we're in the same boat, right? Uh, they know us. Christ dwells in your heart. He lives there. He's got his own room. Okay, I'm being a little funny here. But the idea that, that Christ lives there, he doesn't just come and visit now on occasion. Christ is there. Don't try to hide things from Christ because he lives there. He knows. And when you're tempted about something, that's when you yell out to Christ. You don't think, well, I shouldn't be tempted with this. I don't know what Jesus would think. Well, Jesus knows you're hurt. Jesus wants to hear. Christ dwells in your heart by faith. Rooted and grounded in love. Look at the rest of verse 17. Uh, that you being rooted and grounded in love, that's focused on love, focused on the things of God, 
Um, here's a thought. I, I, I often thought that I should be more loving. I'm going to reach that goal of being loving. That's not what's being portrayed here. The love of God is with you now. This is how you're growing now. To be loving and to know the love of God isn't something, well, eventually I might reach to that. No, it's now. God is in you now. But, well, it doesn't seem all that great. Well, that's because God's not done with you yet. The love of Christ is in you. You are rooted and grounded in his love in this new life that you have in Christ. And it's going to be displayed in the way that you live. And then to know Christ's love, verse 18, they may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ. That you might actually know how much Jesus loves and how much Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Love of Christ is the core of the gospel. Understanding that transforms us. Human love is pretty powerful. I mean, think of all the support that gives. Think of all the joy that gives. Think of all the life that gives. And that's just human love, which is fickle. I mean, even among the best people can be. But with God, no. No. The love of Christ that you're actually rooted in it and that you know how deep it is. I saw a, a poster. Uh, it said, um, when you're young, you thought your parents were on your back and you grow older and you realize they had your back. Jesus has your back. He's not on your back. He has your back. The love of Christ is through all things that you know in Christ powerful. Do you know the height of the love of Jesus? Now I'm going back to those camp songs about the love of God so wide, so high. You can't get over it, can't get around it. Well, you go through the door, the door is Jesus. It's long enough to last for eternity. It's long enough for all that you need. Verse 19, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Now, I, I really love this because it's saying that you will know something you can't know. In fact, you will know something that's unknowable. That you would actually know what is beyond knowledge. Now, here's the thing about God. Can you fully understand God? No. Can you comprehend God? Um, we had a study that says, well, maybe you can't say you comprehend God, you apprehend God, you, but you understand who God really is. You know God truly in Christ. We can actually know what God would have us know because we receive it. And we can grow in it. We can grow in that knowledge. You don't, when you grow in the knowledge of Christ, it's not like Christ's love is getting greater. It's just that you now understand it more. And that happens as we live in Christ, as we read, as we pray. We move up this ladder of prayer till we get to the top. You know, to be filled with God may be filled with the fullness of God. the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's beyond searching out, but you could actually be filled into the fullness of God. Maybe that's an even a better translation. You become Im immersed. You become surrounded. And it's important. We are sinful, leaky vessels. How do you keep a sinful, broken, leaky vessel full, you submerge it. Stay submerged in the presence of God, in the fullness of God, in the love of God. This is what we desire for ourselves. We should pray this for ourselves. This is what we desire for one another. When you pray for someone, do you pray that they'd be happy? 
Well, that's nice. Happy's nice. Beats sad, doesn't it? But there's more. We pray for physical things, and we're used to that because we need them, or we think we do. But what we really need is what this passage is talking about, to know the love of Christ, to know the fullness of what we have in Christ, to grow in that all the way up to the glory of God. What power there is. I want to encourage you to be praying for one another. I thank you for your prayers for me. Let's pray together. Lord, we do pray, even in mind, one another, that we would know the fullness that you've given for us, the fullness of you, and that each would be built up in Christ in their life, where they are, the things they do. That you, O oh Lord Jesus, the constant companion and shepherd and guide would care for and supply the need as it comes. To encourage, to direct, to inspire. Lord, we thank you that you have made us for yourself and that you continually redeem us. Hear our prayers. Fulfill your will in us. We pray this through our Lord Jesus. And may God's people say, Amen.